Good morning. I'm Chris Johnson. I direct the Scientific Computing and Imaging Institute at the University of Utah. Our acronym is SCI, which here in Utah we pronounce SKI, so we're the uh, SKI Institute. I'm here to uh, tell you about some of our exciting research in trying to understand these large amounts of data uh, coming from science and engineering and elsewhere using visualization. Uh, before I get to the actual techniques, I want to make sure we understand some of the words that I'm going to use about how large is large. So a little bit about bytes. Um, most of you are familiar with, with these words, megabytes, gigabytes, but there are more. There are terabytes, petabytes, exabytes, zettabytes, etc. cetera. Um, where are you? Well, my Mac Air disk here has 120 gigabytes. All of our, our uh, PCs, et cetera, have in the hundreds, usually, of gigabytes. Um, when you get to terabytes, this is a, a company-level server, or it could be your teenager's uh, photo and music collection. Uh, <laughs> once we get up to petabytes, this is what the, the world's supercomputers are, are, are doing. They're creating petabytes of data for some of the largest scientific simulations in the world. And once we get to exabytes, that's how much data we have in the entire world. So how much and where is it going and uh, how are we going to deal with it? So this slide shows, try to get a summary of the data that we're creating and uh, what's to come. This is uh, some work by Lesk and Landauer and others to try and quantify how much data we've been creating. So they estimated that if we took all of the, all of the data from the beginning of mankind and turned all of our documents, books, films, et cetera, into digital data, it would be about this many, about 10 exabytes of data, all right? So a few things to notice here. Um, it was in 2003 that we crossed over for the first time in that year alone, we created as much data, new data, that had been created for our 40,000 years of human history, all right? So that's amazing. Now, where are we now? In uh, February of this year, researchers estimated that we have about 295 uh, exabytes of data that we're creating uh, in, the, in each year, which is amazing. I did a quick back of the envelope um, calculation to try and figure out, well, how much is an exabyte? And if you figure out how many trees it takes to print out an exabyte, it turns out that it takes more trees than there are in the world to print out one exabyte. So there over, takes over 500 billion trees to print out one exabyte. That's how, much, that's how big an exabyte of data is, and we have 295 of those. And probably even more amazing is that every two days we are creating as much data as we did from the beginning of mankind till the year 2003. So many of us think that dealing with this data, understanding this data, making the best use of it, uh, moving this data, storing this data, are some of the greatest scientific challenges of our century. So one way that we are working on uh, understanding and making use of this data at the University of Utah, at the Ski Institute, is using visualization techniques. We've been spending a lot of time trying to figure out how we can take this data and create abstractions and visual uh, methods for us to understand using the visual apparatus in our brain. So some of that is in order to look at things that we already know what they look like, so structural types of anatomical medical imaging. There the task is really that the size of the data keeps growing. We get higher and higher and higher resolution. In other cases, it might be to try and understand something that we don't know really what it looks like, but is a more functional uh, abstraction, such as this topological skeleton that connects different arrhythmias in the electrical activity of the heart, so trying to understand these electrical abnormalities uh, in cardiology. From the three-dimensional plus time, we also are trying to understand these large amounts of, of data in other ways, such as looking at the combinations of, of discrete data of network interactions. In this case, trying to understand when networks are being attacked and who's attacking them and how can we better understand where that's coming from and looking at the patterns. So I want to tell you about a few examples of the science and the scientists who we've worked with and how visualization plays an important role in understanding these larger and larger amounts of data. So scientists have always used visualization as an integral part of the visual understanding and thinking process. Watson and Crick in, in the, uh, in the uh, 1990, 1950s 
use these physical models, these three-dimensional physical models to better understand the structure of DNA. And certainly today, the molecular biologists and geneticists use three-dimensional computer visualizations to understand these new structures and these new data. So one example of a uh, example locally is with Mario Capecchi. Mario is one of our most famous scientists at the University of Utah. He won the 2007 Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology for figuring out how to knock out a gene in a mouse, which has really transformed all of our lives. Now that Mario can knock out any gene in a mouse, he's interested in understanding the, the so-called phenotype problem. So the phenotype problem means how those genes are instantiated into, the, uh, into our bodies. So how do they control and understand and relate to our physiology? This is an example of a 18-day-old mouse embryo. It's a normal. For size reference, that's about the size of your little fingernail. The one to the left is a 18-day-old mouse embryo that's had one gene knocked out, the Pax3 gene, which helps control musculoskeletal development. So the task at hand for us is if we take a populations of normals and understand their normal variations in the normals and a population of these uh, gene knockouts uh, and their normal and abnormal variations, how can we better understand those changes of, over, of the different populations for those different genes and then be able to use that information to, to design new diagnoses, new treatments, new therapies. So we've been able to help Mario in a couple of ways. One is to understand those differences and quantify those changes in shape. And other, another is to visualize and all of that data, that large scale data in an interactive way. One of the things that this project helped lead to was this idea of quantifying shapes of populations. And why is this important? Well, some of my colleagues uh, at the Ski Institute have created new ways in which we can take images of populations, of databases of images, of people that have neurodegenerative diseases, such as um, Alzheimer's or autism, et cetera, and then to be able to create a way to have a non-invasive biomarker to figure out if they can earlier diagnose um, someone who has Alzheimer's or that transition from health to disease or earlier diagnose um, autism so that treatment can be uh, started earlier. We're doing this right now and uh, it's, uh, it's a very exciting time. The other uh, technique that I was talking about for with Mario was volume visualization. So this is a system by which we create large amounts of, we have large amounts of data and we want to be able to visualize them. So what you see up here is a system which is called uh, ImageViz 3D that we created. And in the top left uh, image over here, we're taking and looking at a molecule and exploring the insides of this molecule. Down on the bottom left here, we have a, an example of where uh, a radiation technologist might want to create a set of pull-down menus that would associate the hand uh, X-ray data that might look at the hand, the skin, the bone, the vascular, et cetera. We can do very, very large scale data sets, look inside um, and, uh, and explore these data. So what might this be used for? This is an example of a collaboration with George Chen at Massachusetts General Hospital. He's a radiation oncologist and is interested in figuring out how he can take those beams of radiation and destroy cancerous tumors without hitting the healthy tissue. This is an example of the visualization using our system that shows this lung tumor here, uh, but surrounded by healthy lung tissue, and of course, the person is breathing. Um, so we wanna be able to, to get that, that uh, cancerous tissue without being able to hit the other tissue. So within the system, he can see this as a function of time, in real time, interactively. Also, he can associate the tissue of the healthy lung and which he can then take away and isolate interactively where that tumor is. So this is an example of being able to do interactive, large-scale, time-dependent visualization uh, and, and have a, a real application in, in medicine. Another example is to look at large-scale data, very large-scale data, this is uh, the NIH, National Institutes of Health, Visible Mail. It's a program from the National Library of Medicine that several years ago, um, this person donated their body after death, 
uh, to the National Institutes of Health, and they imaged this person at highest resolution with every known imager that we had. So magnetic resonance images and X-ray CT, et cetera. These are registration cords they put on to move from image to image. What they also did at the end was they froze the body, and then they put a high resolution color camera on the top, and then they milled down about a millimeter at a time and took very high resolution images. They put all of this data online, um, and it, this person has been used thousands, tens of thousands of times to create new algorithms uh, by which we can better understand and, and create new technology for medical imaging. One of the things that happened, though, was that that color resolution photography data uh, at every millimeter was so large, there was no visualization system that could look at all of it. And so what happened was people took the data and they had to downsample the data to make it smaller to be able to actually visualize it. And you got pictures that look like this, which are very, very nice. One of the things we did when we created the new ImageVis 3D system, which is very scalable for very large scale data, is we took this, this particular uh, data set and put that in. Because we could interact with the data at the largest and highest scales, one of the things that we found out was this guy was covered with tattoos. Um, there had been people that had looked at this data for years but had not known that he was covered with tattoos. If you think about what a tattoo is, it's just a very small amount of ink in the skin, and the way that we're able to recreate these images is by, from two-dimensional slices, just taking pictures of two-dimensional slices, and then from that, putting them together in a volume, and then interacting and manipulating so we can pull out the, the little bit of ink under the skin to visualize it. So this is a successful technology that's worked on really large-scale data. And one of the things that we're seeing more and more of is the interest and need to be able to take this down to handheld devices. So we now have a system which is called um, ImageVis 3D Mobile, and it works on your iPhone. It's free. You can download it from iTunes. And what you're seeing here is that same X-ray CT scan that you saw before being rendered on the iPhone using the GPU and the CPU of the iPhone. When the data sets get much, much larger, um, we're able to, to look at, at computing the data on a larger server and then being able to view it and control it on your iPhone. Of course, we knew that uh, other devices were coming, and so we also have these uh, working on iPads, and soon they'll work on other tablets as well. So I think we're going to see really a, a huge number of new applications for this wireless handheld devices in medicine, science, engineering, just about every application you can think of, of being able to walk with uh, a wireless device and be able to visualize and interact with your data, could be computed elsewhere in the cloud or on other servers, but visualize and interact wirelessly. Let me tell you about another technology that we created at the University of Utah, which is a system for doing interactive ray tracing. It's called Manta. This is work done by colleagues Chuck Hansen and Steve Parker and uh, Pete Shirley. And you see ray tracing every day. So ray tracing is the underlying graphics technology to do uh, realistic types of rendering. So in all of those movies like Toy Story and, and the other Pixar movies and Disney movies, uh, they're using this kind of uh, visualization graphics and also in all the special effects you see. Well, one of the things that we did was take it to the next level and to create parallel systems that can do really, really large amounts of data. One of the interesting uh, applications of this was in work with uh, Mark Lavoie at Stanford University. Mark convinced the Italian government to have access to Michelangelo's David, and he used a laser range-finding scanner to be able to take very, very high-resolution uh, models, uh, scans of Michelangelo's David. What you're seeing here is the system, our real-time ray tracer, interacting with those millions of triangles that were created in order to visualize this. So this is interactive. What we're doing is we're zooming in so you can see that this is really a model, and there are those little triangles under there, and uh, we're able to interactively visualize it. It's also just beautiful to see the underlying structure of this. Um, we can control the, the lighting and shadowing automatically so you could see what David would look like during different times of the day uh, in an interactive way. What's, uh, what's even more exciting is that Mark has now created a larger, higher, more higher resolution 
version, and uh, he put the data out on the web uh, and, and basically made it a challenge to our community to see who could, who could interactively visualize this data, and we were the first to be able to do this. This is very recent work. It's about a billion triangles and two gigapixels in terms of its size. So now we're zooming in so you can see in the same place the difference in the resolution. And you, you have to go very, very far in to even see individual triangles. They are so small, and this data is so large. Um, this data is now so good that the Italian government does not want these models to be released um, all over the world because you could really make really, really good reproductions using this level of, uh, of models. Another example of some really large-scale data locally, and this is work with Robert Mark, who's a neuroscientist, is understanding the connectivity within the brain. And they've created the largest set of images of the retina of the brain. This is a mosaic of electron microscope images. So to give you a sense of the size of these images, that little corner there is 4,096 by 4,096 pixels, the maximum resolution of an electron microscope. Um, to, uh, to put that in context, your HDTV is about 2,000 by 1,000 pixels, so it would be a little corner in, in this one. So they take the images, they dump the data, they take the images, they dump the data, and then they create these huge mosaics, which end up being about 130,000 pixels by 130,000 pixels. And then they do the next slice, and the next slice, and the next slice. And they want to be able to understand um, these connectivities as we go through the volume of this brain tissue. Well, by the time they're done, they end up with a single one volume data set of 16 and a half terabytes, and then they come to us and say, we need some help with visualizing and understanding and analyzing that data. And I, I see it in a very similar way to Leeuwenhoek. Leeuwenhoek was one of the innovators of the, the modern microscope, and he was able to discover new things because he could see at resolutions that no one had ever seen before. And that's the way I feel about this work with Robert Mark, is that with his new microscope technology, electron microscope technology, and our ability to interactively visualize those terabytes of data, um, we are able to see things and discover things by looking that no one had seen before. Um, let me uh, finish here with a short video. This was an interview for a documentary that uh, was made about scientific computing and visualization. One of the things that's happened, I think, recently on, on the visualization side is the ability to see things at these, these high, high resolutions for the first time um, and, the, and the ability to see them in more of an, a time-dependent, interactive way rather than a played-back movie from one f viewpoint has allowed scientists to gain insight that they couldn't get in any other ways. And this is how we progress in science. These are the tools that we've created that open new windows for the scientists to see in new ways. If you look at many, maybe even most of the great discoveries throughout mankind, you'll find that, that before the great discovery was the creation of a new tool or a tool that's been used in a new way. And that's really where high performance computing and visualization, these high uh, resolution display walls that people are creating, um, the, the graphics cards that, that people are creating, the, the hardware side, the new algorithms, the software, these are the new tools for these scientists to look at their data and their science in new ways and will make new discoveries because of it. And we're really starting to be able to work not only in, in this particular application, but in many applications where you're taking the best people in computer and computational science and the best people in neurosurgery or physics or whatever it is, and you're working together to solve problems that neither of you could have solved previously. And I think that's where we're at with a lot of different applications, is that we're at this tip of the iceberg where we are going to see a golden age of scientific computing, and specifically for some of the applications we're working in is the applications of computing in medicine, where we're going to be able to transform some of the ways that they do medical imaging and diagnosis and treatment um, with computing and it's going to be amazing. Thanks very much.